This is uh, David Hovde uh, for the Purdue Libraries Archives and Special Collections. The date is August 12th, 2014. Uh, I am here at Westminster Village in West Lafayette, Indiana with Professor Emeritus Hobart Jones and Louise Jones, his wife, who will be sitting in on the interview as well. So, Professor Jones, uh, I would uh, appreciate it if you could talk about your uh, your growing up years, where, where you grew up, your early education, and what inspired you to, who or what inspired you to go on to the career that you did. Very good. Well, I always start with my grandparents and great-grandparents because they have been rural associated or rural project associated for years. The grandfather's side in Ireland and the uh, mother's side, I, I should have said in Ireland, the grandfather's side in Wales. And uh, they came to the United States during, during various conditions. But uh, my grandfather Jones settled near Logansport at a farming operation, and he and his wife had nine sons, and all nine uh, turned out to be uh, farmers in the general community in which we lived. And so I was surrounded by farming uh, essentially all my life, but that isn't necessarily in itself uh, the reason. I, I've always had a desire, I guess I had the genes that drove me in the direction of, of reproductive uh, agriculture, crops and livestock and so forth. And I've always been thankful that I was born and raised near uh, West Lafayette, Indiana. It was 40 miles. That used to be a long trip, but by the time I was of college age, it wasn't uh, so long. But I <clears throat> became interested in uh, agriculture. We didn't have a VOAG teacher in our high school, but I did have uh, ready access to a very fine county agent in his office. And uh, I started going there probably at 10, 11 years old uh, to get bulletins or information on how to take care of my poultry and my pigs that I signed up uh, in 4 H club projects. Ultimately, the, the work through 4 H, the county agent, our 4 H club leaders, led me to Purdue University. And um, I was really interested uh, in, in, in immediately, and very shortly after that, I was moved into the assembly at a high school, and the freshmen just in coming into uh, that big room, we were all seated along the library where there were always glass fronts and people shuffling and all. But one fine thing about that inconvenience was that I spotted one day a Purdue catalog. And um, I picked up the catalog and it had a section on agriculture. And I looked at that thing many, many times and they had taken pictures of uh, the farm and the livestock on that Purdue farm right adjacent at the edge of the campus. and. That's sort of the way my interest developed. And from then on, I got encouraged from my folks, my sisters, who were 4-H club members. And uh, ultimately, I was successful in winning uh, some of the trips that sent uh, representatives from our boys and girls clubs to the 4-H club roundup. And of course, it was held at Purdue University. And uh, we had a little taste of university life because 
the students had gone, but the people in the re residences right around the campus rented out rooms to the centers, uh, to the students for uh, their college days. And with them gone for the summer, they let us look in on those rooms and even rented some of them to us. And then we went over to the Union Building and ate our lunch and just little by little those things grew. And um, we had some excellent judging contests that I participated in in the pavilion. And um, so every trip it seemed like I got a little more interested in maybe I could be one of those students. Our neighbor whose farm backed up to our farm I began, he graduated from Purdue, and he began to do county agent work. And uh, he was quite active in not our county, but other counties, and did a good job of uh, visiting and telling me and enlightening me about the work he did and all the work that was out there to be done. And if we had an interest that way, we sure ought to push it. So. Uh, Little by little, Munns Caldwell helped me uh, get a better insight into Purdue, what they did when they went to class, kind of coursework they took, and, and then uh, informed me about the good work that he did. And uh, so those were sort of all contributing factors. Now, I don't mean to imply dad and mother weren't interested. They sure were, and they did not have college degrees. In fact, my dad only went to eighth grade. My mother had a, a high school degree, and they said, uh, the handwriting is on the wall. Get all the good education you can get because every day we see changes that impact farming and impact uh, the way of life that we have chosen. So. Uh, that sort of led me to begin thinking in earnest about college. My high school principal was really good at counseling and telling me how oh, you should take this or you should take this. And uh, so little by little, uh, uh, we were as prepared as we could get and I made application, was accepted and became a freshman in the fall of 1940 at Purdue University, and then graduated uh, a little later. Um, I say a little later because graduation was not automatic then. There were a lot of my friends and acquaintances were drafted by their local boards. War was getting heated up. And as you probably would remember, those who have an association with Purdue, it was required that we take ROTC the freshman year and, and sophomore year of our college work. They issued us uh, uniforms, Army uniforms that we wore regularly to class and uh, to other classes if we didn't have time to get home and change uh, to uh, street apparel. And then uh, we all wore the same shoe. We all had to buy our shoes at the same market. And uh, I got some good training on basic marching and, and uh, they had artillery here. So we worked out on 105 millimeter howitzers that were in the armory. Uh, we had the choice then to go on to advanced and I chose to go to advanced military and would have been a second lieutenant before too long, but they went put us all through a tough physical and I had the, well, unfortunate experience of having the army doctors tell me I had a heart condition that was inconsistent with military service. So, uh, Counselors at Purdue, particularly David Fendler and, and Vern Freeman were excellent counselors and they said, well, we can cite you now some positions that are open. 
and one of the first ones they listed was county agent. And I liked the idea of being in the shoes that I saw my neighbor in a lot of times. And so I signed up with Leroy Hoffman. And it was just but a short time until he uh, appointed me to become assistant county agent for Mr. Sheldon Pershing in Tippecanoe County. So um, I got to carry on my courting of my wife-to-be, my being here in Lafayette, and, and uh, it was a wonderful experience. This is a great county for agricultural activity, of course, and Purdue the center of that. But uh, it was a great uh, county to work in, some wonderful farmers in these good, good counties in uh, Tippecanoe County. And uh, I was quite happy at that kind of work. And one day, my uh, one of my former teachers, Professor Jack Frost, said, I have a letter from my major professor at Ohio State begging me to send him the name of a, a potential graduate student because we're really short at Ohio State. Uh, we need to teach, we're now given the responsibility of training veterinarians who are going into the Army to be meat graders and purchasers of all kinds of meat for the uh, uh, Army or the, the soldiers, the uh, armed forces that they serve. And uh, so that led me then from county to work and uh, immediately into uh, another kind of work, and that was graduate school. But coming out of that then, I was offered an opportunity to be an extension uh, worker here from the Purdue campus. And I assisted a swine management uh, extension agent, John Swab, and uh, I assisted him. And then when he retired, I had that opportunity to, to go there. But I did take a break and do some production work on actual farms where I managed them. We had uh, both of those farms, excellent purebred animals that I know we had the Grand Champion Board to State Fairs and uh, uh, Grand Champion Barra at the fairs. So I was getting a lot of good experience. And ultimately that led back to uh, Purdue University where Professor Harper had a position that had been filled for years and years by W.W. W. Smith. And so he traded that for H.W. Jones. and. Uh, I taught swine production then for uh, 38 years, had some wonderful people in those courses. I swore of the better than 5,000 students. My secretaries told me I had had, I don't believe we had a bad one. And uh, so my, my career then uh, expanded some in addition to teaching the swine production course. I was appointed uh, co-chair with John Cadillac and Ag Econ to head up a uh, multi-purpose kind of a research project where we brought in, of course, the economists to study the buildings, primarily buildings and method of growing uh, animals. Uh, land was a little more expensive then. It was kind of expensive to put a pig on an acre of land or 20 pigs on an acre of land when uh, it would grow 60, 70, 80 bushel corn to acre. So we had a real revolution throughout the corn belt on going from a range uh, rearing of swine into confinement. And again, our committee that uh, Dean Butts, uh, Dean at the time, appointed was John Cadillac and Ag Econ, and Sade Goffer in veterinary medicine, Don Jones, Bill Friday over in Ag uh, Engineering, 
and I represented uh, the production group in animal science, and Max Judge, a fine uh, young meat specialist, was the, uh, the in charge of the carcass type of work that we did in evaluating animals raised under a different environment. So and that and what uh, year was that? Pardon me. What year was that? That 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 all transpired, and let's see, get my dates reasonably close to being right, fifty five, fifty six, okay. and uh, then it extended for a good ten years. Okay. And uh, we were so helped by Dean Betts and going out and getting the money that we could build a representative sample of about all the kinds of houses that were being used by swine producers who were doing it for a living. We had those samples built on one of the university farms and that became the centerpiece for our annual swine day, a huge day in that uh, there would be great crowds. It became so large in fact that we had to change the swine day from Friday for adults to Saturday for FFA and and four uh, H club people and so forth, but the farm or the barns were all built on university property right at the edge of the campus, and that's where we uh, had the programs in the morning and moved in to the pavilion for a while for our business meetings and and the oral reports, and finally we wound up in the Purdue Music Hall. We were that large. And uh, we had a, a very strong program. We were invited, those of us on the committee uh, were invited to I don't know how many universities neighboring. I remember going to Penn State and Kentucky and Illinois and uh, Michigan, so we were, very glad that we could help the uh, producers in Indiana first and provide information that our good friends on the other staff uh, positions at universities could use as well. But that was sort of the highlight for my research. And uh, then when you have research of that kind, it brings on extension <laughs> and the county ages invited me to come out and speak to a lot of uh, them and take them on tours and point out uh, what we had found to be some weaknesses or some problems that you watched very, very carefully. For example, some of the modern new swine buildings were elevating feed supplied uh, or mixed and put in bins at the end of the house and then supplied to each individual pen through an auger that ran, of course, horizontal. And we found that by the time that feed had been transferred, many, many, many feed, it separated and the heavy parts would go one way and the light parts another. And just little things of that kind we had uh, uh, an interest in uh, getting uh, uh, well documented so it could be helpful to builders and to uh, to others. We had a carcass emphasis all the time because we didn't want any particular kind of a building uh, to increase the fat deposition because lean muscling was, was uh, the strong element of beef and, po and the poultry. And so we were always conscious of, of the carcass quality, as much uh, lean muscling as we could get in them and as little fat as we could get in them and do it genetically without sacrificing a lot of rate of gain and, and uh, that type of thing. But um, that was an excellent experience because as you imagine, I was being able to use uh, so much of that in my swine production classes. And uh, not just animal science classes taught a lot of those facts that we had learned, but Ag Econ did and Ag Engineering did 
And uh, so it was, uh, veterinary medicine were interested, of course, in, in uh, what we were finding in the way of any potential disease transmissions. And uh, so that was uh, really the highlight of my, uh, my research over the years and teaching was uh, one of my responsibilities and like everybody you uh, try to give the kids the best uh, most worthy dollar for every dollar of tuition and, and so we worked at trying to give a, a, a good up-to-date course and one that they could enter stand all the uh, pieces fitting together in what we call a production course. But those would be some of the highlights, some of the high points. I did get in, of course, quite early to judging, and not because I thought that I had all the answers as to what type of a pig somebody should raise, but whatever kind of pig they decided to raise should be a good one and uh, sound in feet and legs so they last over a long time if they're in the breeding herd and uh, the rate of gain, uh, things that contribute heart capacity, lung capacity, increase their, their uh, susceptibility to weather change and so it was uh, uh, it was sort of, uh, uh, well, really a, a combination that we could put together, and I I liked the beets part of it, and I liked, of course, the uh, the genetic part of it, and above all, the the cost. The ag econ people were very critical of the cost, as they should have been and were. They had what they called the dirty five. And when you build a building, you want to examine very carefully the dirty five, the depreciation on that building, and the interest that it took to buy that building, and the taxes that you had to pay for, uh, the, and the insurance that would cover that building. And every pig was charged a certain amount for those five things when he was uh, a, well, a uh, resident for a while. So it was, it was a good study and uh, we, we think we kind of came out with the whole pig, not just a part of it. And uh, that was certainly our aim and Dean Butts and later Dean Reed and all those folks were very supportive. Claude Harper, a wonderful head of our department, and we had uh, Walt Woods that helped with a little lot, and it was really a very, very interesting time in my life. But that is sort of a quick encapsulation. Everybody wouldn't call it quick, but <laughs> I get started. I have fun reminiscing. <laughs> Yeah, and my wife just reminds me that I found, like all uh, university personnel, that a PhD was uh, a certain kind of qualification that people look to. And uh, <clears throat> so <clears throat> one of my good friends was uh, on the board of directors of the National Science Foundation, and he told me of a program that uh, they had for people who were late in their career and deciding to get a PhD degree. And so I applied and received one of those uh, awards. And I had a good friend who was a uh, Purdue graduate, had done some good studies, published some good work, and uh, he had a PhD program at the University of Kentucky, and so my department head and dean were kind enough to give me a leave for a year, and I went down and did my coursework there, and my research started in 
finished that then at Purdue. And what year was that? You got, what year did you get your degree? Boy, let's see. It must have been 60s, but I'm not just sure well, which, 67, 68, okay. along in there. Mm -hmm. Quite a while after my PhD, mm -hmm. or after my master's and mm -hmm. ma uh, bachelor's degree. Okay. Um, he, you talked about a lot about your extension uh, agent work and so on. What, can you tell me what the, you know, like a, what an average week, what an extension agent would do? Sure. You know, just like as, how as much time in the office, how much time in the field, and right. what kind of work they did? We always did seem to have stages of the year for certain activities. Now, it's not that we didn't blend some of them or cross some of them, but say basically in the winter months, we knew the farmers were not in the field. It was an excellent time to bring them up to the latest uh, word around about the hybrids that were doing so well in production of corn and where they might look to find those seeds for the coming year. Or maybe it would be wheat or oats or whatever. But the winter months were spent in trying to look ahead and get farming uh, operations planned, well planned, and as you know, the best plan go astray. And it didn't have much to do with the weather, but we did on where you're going to get your fuel, or if your repair, if your equipment needed repair, let's get it fixed up. So when we go to plant, it'll be ready and things of that kind. We had those schools uh, with ag engineering and seed companies and. Okay, then the next thing, we were right into 4-H club time, signing up for 4-H for uh, kids and, and it started in March and April and so forth. Now, we didn't do as much, needless to say, as assistant county agents, if you're a county agent. Those assistant county agents were wonderful leaders, uh, men and women of the project. But that was always a big push in the spring of the year, as was calving and farrowing and lambing and a lot of the production things uh, with livestock. And those were covered extensively. And then in the summer months, of course, you had kind of a mixed band. You had 4-H going, you had uh, crop days going, field, field uh, inspections where you had tours and they go out and look at the different wheats about ready to be harvested uh, at the agronomy farm. We were fortunate to have that. And so we had a lot of field days that would be in keeping with uh, the, the what was going on, <laughs> in other words. And then as you worked into the fall, we were always headed up with county, with the county fairs just before the kids would go back to school or were required to go back to school. And it was a good time to look at harvest. A lot of the harvest prospects and the harvest itself of small grains. And they had excellent machinery exhibits to help those wealthy farmers spend their money come <laughs> cold weather. And uh, then that built in, you know, to still another stage of what you might be doing in the fall, winter, livestock care and bad weather or uh, sailing, selling, uh, filling contracts of the corn that you produced and, and the beans that you produced. And so it was, it was never uh, clean cut, just this or nothing. There was always some blending, but that's where the emphasis was as far as paper articles, articles in the papers or uh, the journals or uh, publications of one kind or another. And uh, that's where the programs were planned. And of course, uh, you were always, <coughs> if you were a 4-H club leader, always saying now, how can we make next year better? And uh, how can we get the kids to fill out their record books? <laughs> that was 
a thing that no boys club kid liked to do. You had to keep a record of all the feed he fed and how much that feed costs. It was really excellent training, but it wasn't too well. I, I thought a lot of times and laughed. At, uh, they tell the story, one little boy had a dislike for keeping records, so he signed up for about five different projects. And he turned in those record books and somebody would would uh, be looking at the dairy book and then say, for all of my records, see the beef book. And he'd sign up for beef and all of all the records about look in the swine book. <laughs> and, and so he would give them a, a run around to get out of work and on the books. And uh, I was telling my wife one time we were sitting on a show box, a box that the kids kept their equipment in, and the little boys right across the aisle were finishing up their record books. You had to, had to turn them in or you couldn't exhibit. And um, so they were over there working away with pencil and paper and didn't have calculators in. And one of them looked at the other and said, you know, I lost $110 if I don't count my feed. <laughs> and so there were a few lessons learned, but, but it, was, it was kind of humorous and yet it was uh, serious business. A lot of the, the uh, local, in particular, awards to outstanding pig or outstanding sheep or outstanding corn club were based on the record books, not just the project itself, but what kind of records did they keep. And I thought that was very, very worthwhile. And some of the banks, if I recall right, used to uh, uh, provide little awards, just like you take get a blue ribbon for your apples or whatever, and uh, they would give you a blue ribbon for the way you kept your record book. So that was good business, I thought, and some counties did that. But I've, um, I've probably dominated this, so I'll keep quiet. <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, now, you came to Purdue as a student what year? No, I, I came as a freshman in 1940. 40. Okay, uh, could you talk about what life was like for a student in 1940? You, you did talk about your ROTC yes, time. Yes. But what about the other aspects and the dorm and, and just what, what was life like as a student? Well, And that would have been during uh, President Elliott's. Yeah, that's Sorry, right. Correct. A fine man, and I, I remember the administration kept talking, and I mean ag administration, Dean Freeman, Dean Fendler, all of our good instructors would talk about don't panic. If you get drafted, you're going to be drafted no matter where you're here or where you are. And don't rush in and and sign up for something it can deliver on, or it will wait until you have a more opportune time. And um, so it was, it was hectic. You see, we were three semesters in. No one ever left. And uh, we, we moved right on through and, and graduated a lot of guys in a hurry, or not a hurry, but you cut them short one year by uh, having the three semester program. And that helped some of them keep from being drafted till they had a degree. So it was hectic that way. As I told you, you know, we all wore uniforms. And even when it was 100 out there, we had winter uniforms. <laughs> and uh, we marched, we had, uh, uh, started with, of course, you know, the squad and then the battery and then the battalion and their regiment and then ultimately the corps. They had an intramural field right over here where all these residence halls are. The band came out there every Thursday and we marched in review and um, we had a lot of discipline. Boy, they 
told you to do something, do it, like it was the real army. And um, that was a little bit of a, in the back of everybody's mind all the time, but you had to face it. And um, so it was uh, a matter of about, oh, 7,000 students of the greatest I knew. And it was hurt a lot by the draft and by the prospect of, of uh, well, what you were faced with. And so uh, the numbers were way down, gasoline was rationed, and you could drive from here to Salisbury to Purdue University Union and maybe see a half dozen cars. And you go in a fraternity, and there might be one, and that would be the cook. And uh, the guys didn't have cars. Some of them did, I suppose. There were a few spotted here and there. But uh, it was very sparse, everything we did. And, and uh, we tried to cooperate, I think, all the staff and the students in rationing. We all had ration turn in our ration books to, uh, if we lived in a dormitory there, or if we lived in a fraternity there, and the union building had to have record, or, uh, 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 ra well, ration books, you know. And uh, so it was, uh, many ways, was, was different. And uh, as I say, I remember sitting in front of the radio on Sunday evening after we had just had an evening meal and we were sitting around uh, uh, the radio listening to the evening news and they came on and said the Japanese had just uh, bombed Pearl Harbor and uh, that there had been certainly that two or three battleships, and they named them, had been badly damaged or sunk. And one of the kids jumped up and said, my golly, my brothers. On, and it was Wednesday of that week before we found out that he was missing in action. And so it touched pretty close home a lot of times. And uh, I live, my wife well, reminds me, I live there at, uh, Alpha Gamma Rho, we were right at the end of University Street, and we were in a lot of, a lot of activity. The quad, or the, the uh, carry quad people coming, and and uh, and the other folks coming from the other way, and uh, it was busy, busy place. But I remember after we had found out about this young man being. Uh, lost and missing in action that the next morning I guess the counselors in the School of Agriculture were just lined up wanting to enlist or drop out of school and wait till they were drafted and there was a real a real sense of, uh, of uh, loyalty and patriotism all through the school. The music was beautiful. It was all national. That was the band and, and of course, Alice Stewart was a great club. And um, it was it was a tough time and, and I wish it could have been normal, but we made the most out of it. And, and I, I was hanging by the, my toenails. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, when I got this letter from my commanding officer said I was to report to him, I was Colonel Beers in the armory there. And then he told me and I called right away my battalion leader and said, I got to have service of some kind, make it limited or put me someplace where I could do something. He said that discharge or that uh, Letter said discharge, that's the way it is. So I felt badly. I lost four good friends. And uh, 
of them was a Medal of Honor winner for Purdue, and we only had a couple of those. And Harry Michael from Northern Indiana, fine guy. Jim Crick lost his life. He was from Fort Wayne. And Billy Sumner had a terrible ending. He was flying planes of aircraft carriers, and they always had a briefing of their target in a ready room before they took off. And there were all the pilots for all those planes were gathered in there and a kamikaze pilot hit him and knew right where to hit him and just, I don't know how many pilots were taken. Bill was one of them, Bill Sumner. But those were the things that took the fun out of a, mm -hmm. of a college education for a lot of people. And uh, it was all business. And I think it was a, a serious attitude that we didn't see a lot of years. I had a chance to look over, see a lot of them. <laughs> and uh, it was, I thought, as you think back over it, pretty, pretty obvious that the students took it in, in a stride and tried to do everything they could. I, when we first talked to, together, you talked about your teaching philosophy. Yeah. Something a uh, two-pronged attack. That's Could right. Could you expand on that? Could you expand on that for me? Well, yes. I, I've always thought, and I had several good examples before I started teaching myself. Don Kays at Ohio State was a wonderful teacher, Joe Coffey. I had Jack Frost here, a heck of a good teacher, Lowell Harden, who's still living, by the way. I don't know if you know Lowell or not. He lives right over here on the first house on Calvin. He must be 95, 96. And he was one of my early teachers. And, uh, but, but I, the more I thought about it, when they gave, gave me a, an opportunity to be an instructor was hey, it's two people, it's one the course, and then it's the course. And that person has to be honest, he has to be fair, he has to be uh, one of the boys, if that's what it takes to laugh at their joke, or, uh, you know, just then speaking of Lowell, right there he is, walking there by right through the fountain. Every morning he walks over there at this time to the uh, main building. But, but I think you have to have a, a, well, shall I say flexible, uh, a little bit anyhow, attitude with these kids. You gotta remember they're 18, 19, first time they've been away from home, and the first time they've been responsible for their own decisions and you gotta be fair with them. And uh, maybe some folks would call that being too liberal, but I thought it was just being fair. And if they learned something from that, then maybe that was part of teaching after all. And then the teaching itself, I always looked at it as like writing a book. And the first few days or first few lectures you better do a good job of pointing out how the course you're gonna teach fits into modern day agriculture and what we hope they'll come away with from the course at the end of the semester that would permit them to go out and do it or permit them to go out and show somebody else how to do it and and be accurate and, and, and right in it. So, we would start out with a forward. And um, I likened it, I was told about it one time, to driving a Budweiser team of horses. <laughs> that you had a driver sitting up here who could see all six head. And you're gonna be managing it, and you've gotta look over six head. And one of those lead horses right in the front is the genetics. 
that genetics better be sound and better be for the best you can get out of every animal. And that's why we crossbreed. And so we'd start the, with the genetic makeup of a herd. And then the next thing, of course, is the biggest cost of raising a pig is that other lead horse, it's nutrition. You better be very well founded on modern nutrition and what that pig needs and and how to get it the cheapest and so forth. And then the wheel team, the two in the, in the middle, you got to decide about this building thing. Are you going to put a lot of money into those buildings and take very little labor, just press a few buttons? Or are you going to have a blend of the two? Or are you going to have all labor and very few dollars spent on equipment? And then, of course, back here at the wheel team, you better be looking down all the time and figuring out how you're going to merchandise those pigs. And not only how you're going to merchandise them, are you going to contract them, are you going to hedge, or what are you going to do? Not only do you have to think about how you're going to merchandise them, but you darn well better be thinking about what kind of a product is that housewife going to find tomorrow morning when she finds that pig in carcass form. And is it going to be, well, I'll pass this ham up and go look at the poultry or go look at the beef steak, because you can't stay in business. All these other horses are no good to you if that one is is limping. So those that's sort of the approach I use. Okay. Thank you. Um, when you came back to Purdue in 1950, yeah. that was... Uh, you know, the GI Bill had been going on oh, for yes. uh, oh, a yes. few years, and oh, yes. that must have been a, 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 another really interesting and wild it was. time at Purdue. It was. All those barracks and there, everything everywhere. And, and those good boys. We had a lot of students that come back, and they were here on, uh, you know, the, the uh, governmental program. And uh, uh, it was, it was, and my wife, had friends, new people there in those barracks, and she did babysitting for them, and they had none of the, the old barracks, that remind you of the new buildings out there by the home hospital, but they had black and whites, and they were little two-story jobs that they bought them by the carload and uh, a little larger families. Somebody come back and had a couple of children or a child and they had those black and whites. But you're right, it was very interesting. And, and uh, the GI Bill brought a lot of good people to this campus that otherwise wouldn't have come here. Yeah. And I thought that was great. They were mature, there wasn't any horse around and they knew where they wanted to go. And if you didn't, Agree with them. They'd explain it very explicit to you why I want to do this, why I want to do this, and they were a sharp bunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember one person telling me that when he was a student here, right after World War Two. Yes. He uh, he was housed at least temporarily in a what had been a I think a factory building or something. Yes. And he said he had 150 roommates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he probably. It might have been the dormitory that was made out of some of the ag engineering building. Okay. And uh, I think they they did have uh, wide open <laughs> circumstances. <laughs> and uh, that, that was, and then of course, we had um, uh, a lot of the boys were married and little kiddies, so you had a lot of little children that were mingled into the mix too. And we used to have a beautiful little woods, if you can imagine, right across State Street, and right beside it was the airport road. And there were beautiful trees there. And we call it the Dean's Pasture Field. We ran a lot of our cattle there, the Purdue herd of cattle. And uh, of course, those all came down, and it changed the appearance of the whole South Campus with the 
black and whites, but certainly they needed a, a good place, and they, they provided it. But um, we had uh, had a lot of mature kids, boy, they knew what they wanted, and, and uh, they didn't hesitate to tell you, which is good. And uh, every case was different then. They weren't just pretty uniform set. And it was well, the old airport road they talked about. You know, they, where do you live? Oh, down there by the old airport road. <laughs> and you had talked earlier about uh, you had a connection with J.C. Allen. Yeah. And his, could you talk about that? You did some work for him, is that correct? Well... Actually, when we are in charge of a uh, species, like I was with swine, taught swine production, and provided a lot of information on swine nutrition for other courses. And uh, so, uh, to get to your question, I want to state it again so I make sure I, I, I get it right. What was your question? About J.C. Allen? You yeah. had mentioned you worked and with him? Or? And then for these demonstrations, things we wanted to do and all, we had a little farm. And I mentioned Airport Road and the Dean's Pasture. We were just a little farther west. And I was manager, I was responsible for the management of that farm. And then I took the students there, we have a two hour live a week, I took the students there and actually had them participate in some of the things like notching pigs or Tuscan boars or whatever. We had some good reproductive labs there. There's a lot more to a good reproduction than just turning a boar and a sow together. And we, we could demonstrate and they'd see things that, that, and that's where JC and Chester would come out every once in a while and say, can we get three or four students in the, in the group and get a picture of this or that? Or they'd come out, Cliff Breeden, who was a herdsman, he was full time there, uh, taking care of the herd. And he'd set up my labs uh, as far as what animals I needed and where I needed them and so forth. And uh, ahead of the time the class came, and uh, it was a good, uh, a good place for J.C. to come out and pose. We would pose some of these things for him, like ear knots in a pig or taking out his needle teeth or those kind of things, that he might get a picture request once in a lifetime for it, but he needed that when he needed it. And so he would come out and take pictures. He and Chester. So looking back on your career, what would you say you're most proud of? I was most proud of the fact that I got along uh, well with all my, well, classmates, if you want to call it that, the other guys I worked with, it was helpful to me to go into a nutritionist and say, hey, this is your business and it's kind of a sideline with me, but I want the best I can get. And they would help me. On, and I did the same thing for them. They, they want the latest in swine production. So, so it was a lot of the interchange I had with my fellow staff but you'll never replace in your heart the good students. And they stop and see us yet. And they've got grandkids of their own and, and we, we just love to uh, get a call from them. Davy Nichols, his home is right up here in uh, Brixton. And he's on the staff now at uh, Kansas State, has been for a number of years. And he goes by, back and forth, and he'll call, or he'll come by. Steve Nichols, the county agent at, at uh, Carroll County, Delphi, was around uh, for an undergraduate when I had him, and I got him a job at the barn. He needed he needed work, and uh, he comes down and sees me, 
oversees us. He knows Lois too. And she's been an important part of it. Don't, no way should I shut her out because she was patient and helpful and you come up with some pretty naughty problems on things that happen in class and uh, you don't know exactly how to happen. Uh, just as an example, it's not very nice, but if you don't mind, I'll tell it to you and hope maybe it should be on there, I don't know. But the uh, Fred Andrews was a really a thinker, and he had a man over in uh, mechanics that was a good friend of his, Mr. Watley. And they got the idea that they needed to have a pregnancy tester for swine, and they could run in a group of prospective brood sows. They'd been prospective because they'd been with a herd boar for several days, and they wouldn't, didn't want to feed her if she wasn't pregnant, but they went, that is, didn't want to feed her real well. Just kind of a basal diet if she wasn't pregnant. And so they would get her into a narrow spot, and they would hold this to the uterine area, and they would get a reflection whether she was pregnant or not. Well, I had that out there one day at the barn, like I was telling you, that was our, our unit for demonstrating and so forth. And I was explaining how it worked and what to do and uh, what it did. And, and I they handed it to this boy and I said, now you can try it, and he did. And there was a gal standing right behind him, a girl student. And when he finished like that, he went, hey, look at this, to that gal. Now, how do you handle a deal like that, you know? And and that was a, it was kind of humorous in a way, but not to that poor lady. She was embarrassed to death. And the wonder she didn't cry, but she didn't. She kind of took it and went on with it. And and I had later years gals, a lot of them, as time went on, and they took some really good jobs, and you'd like to treat them just the same way, or maybe a little more polite if you could do than men, and yet that was a problem because you know the, he's good to them, he's soft on girls, and. There were always little problems like that that we didn't have any training to, to really cope with, philosophical or philosophy or whatever. And, but, uh, and to be fair to them, you know, when they walk in that door, that you got some super kids with super brains and you got others that are really hard put to stay eligible. And how do you help these without ignoring the very best because you want them to move on and solve and do great things. And so it's, it's uh, they're all enrolled in the course, but you kind of find yourself picking and choosing as you look down the road to the future. And, but there's things that are kind of tough to handle on some of his philosophy that I don't have any training for. And, and uh, you know, the good Lord kind of helps out if you call on him. And so I've always wanted to be fair and honest and, and uh, give every young person what he deserves. And I know I was castigated I had my brother in class, and he got a B. And uh, some of his friends, uh, Jim never did say anything to me, but some of his friends really gave me heck because I didn't fudge the grade, but he didn't have it there. And you know, you gotta figure out what to do, what's right, and uh, we had some interesting experiences. As I've told uh, people this. Uh, 
you know, Fenmer Hall used to be old ag hall. And all over the campus, in case of fire, there was a window you opened up and there was the iron ladder and platform and you went down. Well, then they decided to put in the circle, the shoot to shoot thing. And one day I was in class and <clears throat> in an ag hall, a Fenmer hall, and had a knock on the door about 10 minutes before the class was over. And I went there and the man said, can I come in a minute? And I said, sure. And he said, um, I'm with the physical department and we'd like to get a class about this size in this building to try out that fire escape for us and see how they work and how it goes. And <laughs> he said, can we use this class? And I said, well, uh, if it'll help the cause, I'll ask you guys. And yeah, all right, so <clears throat> they thought it was okay. So he came back right on the button and uh, took us back to the fire escape <coughs> and showed us how we were supposed to activate it. And uh, he said, now, first guy up, opens that little door, press it in and trust the crash bars and then it'll open in. And then you grab this bar up here and just swing out and drop off and you go down. And I said, okay. And I said, who wants to go first? And I swore I had 40, 45 kids in that class that were all pointing at me. <laughs> so I knew I'd had it. So I said, okay, tell me when. And he fixed the doors back up. and <laughs> But we laughed about that. We've seen some of the kids I'd had in class. We laughed about it. I kind of figured it was coming, but I, I really, it didn't hit me. But Fortunately, I had a good swing and I had a good slide, so. <laughs> but there was a lot of good times with teaching and I enjoyed every one of them. And the kids had a lot of, <laughs> we had an ag boy <clears throat> by the name of John Kitchell and his uh, cousin Ted played for IU and um, John was an egg boy, so he came here. And uh, he, he uh, made the cut, I'm not sure how, but he made the cut. Never got in the game. And uh, he was in class, the kids talked to him all the time about basketball. Got there a little early and talked to him about basketball a lot of, a lot of days. And so we were playing a holiday tournament at Mackey Arena, and we had drawn a team from Texas, and I had never heard of the team <laughs> since. And by gosh, we had a big lead, and they put John in. <coughs> and somebody stole the ball and gave him a long pass, and he went up and got a lay in, but he hurt his hand, and he came running down the floor, <laughs> shaking his hand the, the other end. And the next time we had class, when John came in the door, everybody stood up and went. <laughs> John took it all right, but he could have gotten mad as an old hand because he finally gotten in a ball game, and that's the way they <laughs> appreciated it. But there, there were good times and. Some bad times, we lost some kids in accidents. And like we said, uh, I lost good friends in the war. And, but overall, it was a fine career. Kind of ran in our family. Lois's dad was a teacher, and my uncle was a teacher, so we could always go to them and get a little advice. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate well, your Well, I hope it time. suits your needs. Oh, absolutely. And A lot uh, of great information. I get started, you can tell I'm hard to get shut off. <laughs> you, don't, you don't necessarily need and to There you go. Okay. Uh, it seems as though uh, when I was a freshman, we had streetcars, not buses. And the streetcar came down not every street. It came down uh, University Street and stopped at Stadium and then back up and connected with State Street, went over the bridge and up the hill, up or down the hill and over the bridge and into Lafayette. And the students all rode that streetcar and there weren't near as many students, but they rode the streetcar and he'd get the end of the line and he'd switch the s seats back, you know, and take the trolley and put on the other end and go the other way. <coughs> and the students were always mischievous about something. And one night they decided, <coughs> and there was a real bad rain, and they would ride that streetcar where else? Not go to walk, they were going to ride a streetcar. So he stopped at uh, the old gold black there by the armory, you know, black and gold, that little restaurant. And then he'd come right on down to the end of university. Well, he stopped there and they all went up to him and said, hey, will you stop there at 6.0? 600 block, because we just live west of there and we're going to get soaked. And if you'd let us out a block or so quicker, we'd stay drier. He said, nothing to it. I stopped in with the straight So what, one of those yokels that had to walk in the rain remembered that out at the barn where he used to work, or at the shop, Purdue shop, and they'd have to take the wagon in there and take off the, the wheel and grease that stub with axle grease. And he said, I know where there's a brand new five gallon bucket of axle grease. And they made some paddles out of shingles. And they went back there and they took, when well, nobody was coming, no cars, there weren't many of them. They took and started about 100 feet from the end of the track and greased those tracks, both sides. Greased them real greasy. So they said they heard the old boy stop at the armory and then he picked up and he was clanging that old bell. Anybody get away or bicycle or across the street, he'd clang that old bell. And here he came and he slammed on the brakes and he wound up over by Lambert Arena. <laughs> 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 and they said the darnest crowd of police cars and wreck cars and, and, and the funny thing about it, <coughs> the cops came around real early the next morning questioning everybody that lived along here, including the guys that were yeah. kind of into this. And <coughs> we had a back porch to the living room. And when they finished with a bucket of grease, they just threw the bucket in under there, mm -hmm. <laughs> under the porch. And so the policeman came out to the cook in the kitchen, and he said, now, have you heard any strange uh, conversation about what went on out here last night? He said, anything that give me a lead to, to where that person that did that might be? And she said she had to cross her fingers and look out the window and say, no, I don't know anything about it. And she could look right out there at the porch and there was that empty five-gallon <laughs> bucket. <laughs> she had, had to fib, but yeah. she kept the kids safe. And I don't think they ever found out yeah. who did it, but boy, it caused a commotion. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Well, I hope I haven't gra rambled on oh, here. The absolutely not. Material that you didn't. This is didn't all need. terrific. I just hope I hit it on the head what you mm -hmm. wanted.